today as we come to the table. Everyone was at least saying they were a Christian. That's why it was such a shock to me. I was one of those everyones growing up in church, going to church, thinking I was going to heaven, thinking I knew God, and finding out very abruptly and sharply I did not know God and I was not going to heaven. That throws a wrench in your religion really fast. And so he's dealing with that right here, and we deal with that in the South. I think sometimes we have to recognize that when we're talking to people, is to be praying and saying, you know what, where's the fruit in your life that you know Christ? Again, not unrighteous judgment as we talked about last week, but fruit inspecting so we know how to pray and we know how to share to find out, are you really in Christ or not? With as far as our culture has strayed from Christianity, there's still a large portion of society who identify as Christian, though they lack any personal relationship with Jesus. They know they're imperfect, but they assume that they're good enough that surely God would accept them. Well, thanks for staying with us today as we come to the table, the daily Bible study program of Pastor Mark Kirk of Calvary Knoxville. If you could be good enough on your own, you know, being kind most of the time, giving money to good causes, attending church every so often, and avoiding blatant immorality, there would be no need for Christ to have died, right? Well, as Pastor Mark will remind us in today's message, salvation can only happen through accepting Jesus. Now let's join Pastor Mark in the book of John, chapter 7, as he begins his message entitled, Are You Thirsty? Well, so we're up to John, chapter 7, as we're going to be looking today at John, chapter 7, verses 25 through 53, finishing John, chapter 7, and looking at thirsting for God. Now, as we look at this today about being thirsty, guys, every one of us have been thirsty at some time in our life. And I love this about the Lord because he uses analogies of things we can understand. He uses analogies of things we can associate with. And so he uses things like thirst. Who hasn't been thirsty? Who hasn't been just dying for a drink at a time, you know, you're, you're, you've been, whether you're out in the desert or whether you're hiking or whatever you're doing, you're traveling, what, working in the backyard, you need a thirst. The Lord knows that we'll understand this, and he's the only one that can satisfy that thirst. And today he's going to make that announcement we're going to see of being the one to satisfy us. Now, some of you are trying to satisfy that thirst with other things. Maybe in your past or present, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, maybe it's uh, sex, maybe it's a hobby, something that seems less threatening, uh, sports, whatever the case might be. Some of these things in and of themselves aren't wrong. There's nothing wrong in sports or hobbies or whatever the case might be. But if you're looking for that to satisfy, you're going to continually remain empty. There's no way you're going to be satisfied. Some of you wives this morning, you're not satisfied with your husband. He's not romantic enough. He doesn't pay enough attention to you. You'll never be satisfied by him. He may learn to be a better husband. He may be a little bit more romantic from time to time. He may do better at it. And for the moment, you'll think, finally, then it'll go right back to where you're not going to be satisfied. You know why? Because only Jesus can satisfy. Husbands, some of you, your wife's not satisfying you this morning. She's not what you thought she'd be, or maybe she's this, maybe she's that. She'll never fully satisfy because she's only a human. Only Jesus can satisfy you, man. He's the only one that can do it. And this is something we have to learn as believers. Now, I go beyond that. You're looking for something in life to satisfy you. If I could only get on the voice. Or if I could maybe just, you know, whatever the case might be, get that car or buy that house or do this, take that vacation, I'd be satisfied. Listen, I'm not going to lie to you. Those things temporarily can satisfy for the moment, but then that moment's gone. And once again, you're dissatisfied. 
Why is that? There's only one that can satisfy. It's the Lord. When we were created, God lived inside of us. He put his spirit inside Adam and Eve, and they were completely and thoroughly satisfied. They had no more needs or desires. They were satisfied. The wedding was an added blessing. The husband and wife was an added blessing. The, the taste to food, the enjoyment of life, that was an added blessing. But if you took all of that away, they were already satisfied. They didn't need a husband to be satisfied. They didn't need a wife to be satisfied. They didn't need a thing to be satisfied. They didn't need to be famous or whatever to happen to be satisfied satisfied they just were because God put his spirit within them but then when the fall came guess what happened the fall happened and now all of us are born without the spirit of God in us we are born dissatisfied that's why we come out crying <laughs> something's not right and it stays that way our whole life. And we're looking, what can it be? Oh, it's the new video game as a kid. It's that new toy. It's the, it's the, you know, the big wheel or whatever it is you know, that you really love. And then you get older. And then it's the, the, the girlfriend or the boyfriend. Or then it's the whatever. Then it's the husband or wife. And then it's the house. And then it's the car. And then it's the, you name it, it keeps going. And you find yourself moving from season to season, looking for that thing that will satisfy and never getting it. Because unless you finally run to Jesus, you're not going to figure out what it is you're so desperately chasing. And then once you get to him, now you can rest. Wow. Things down here don't have to satisfy me. Because you do, Jesus. And you know what? Nothing down here is going to do it. I'm not going to be fully satisfied till I'm in the kingdom anyway. And now I'm fully satisfied in my relationship with you. And so I'll take this, Lord, and then I'm going to enjoy you for eternity. That's what today is about. That's what Jesus is going to do when it comes to crying out to them, are they thirsty? And, and he's going to challenge them, do they, are they thirsty? Do they want something to drink? And that's going to be the challenge he's going to give us today. Are we thirsty? What are we looking for to satisfy that thirst? Now, what's the setting? Remember the setting. We're right in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's an eight-day feast where they remember Jesus's and God's provision, if you will, in the wilderness for 40 years. They didn't know his name was Jesus at that time, but God's provision for 40 years in the wilderness. He gave them their food. He gave them their drink. He supplied everything that they needed. And so now they would celebrate for eight days living outdoor in these little booths they built, you know, reminding themselves of living in the wilderness. And they camped all over the hillsides of Jerusalem, all over the Mount of Olives. They would go to the temple every day and the priests would go down to the Pool of Siloam, which is down at the very bottom of Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount, the bottom of the city of David. They would get a big thing of water. They would carry the water up with a big procession, people celebrating as they came back up. They would come to the water gate, not to be confused with Nixon. They would come to the water gate. They would have three trumpet blasts, and they would go into the water gate. They'd bring the water up to the altar, and they would pour out the water at the altar, and everyone would celebrate, remembering God gave us water from the rock, and now we have water to pour on the rock because he is our rock. And they would celebrate all week long, making sacrifices, even during the week, making sacrifices for uh, the nations of the world. They would sacrifice for other nations, and they'd do less and less sacrifices each day until they came to the final day where there was one sacrifice. And that one sacrifice was to represent their Savior. The sacrifice, it represented really their nation. And it was a picture of God, uh, you know, what God did for the nation of Israel. And they were going to sacrifice on this great day where they would celebrate what God had done for the nation. And that's where we are where we take up in this. The Lord has been there now for, he came later in the week, probably got there in time for the feast, but came a little bit later, maybe stayed incognito, so to speak. Midway in the feast, he goes up to the Temple Mount and begins teaching. And we started that last week. He's blowing them away. They cannot believe his authority, his power, how wonderful his words are. I mean, it's so, so captivating. It's hard to imagine that a man could speak and it'd be so captivating that when they send the police, they can't even arrest him. We'll get to that in a moment. It's just power, authority, everything, God in human form. And no one could deny it, although some did. But at the same time, those who were honest couldn't deny it. And so last week, remember, we saw Jesus teaching. He was, if you will, this heavenly scholar. They were marveled at his words, having never studied. And they were saying, how does he, you know, how does he do this? He said, don't judge me by unrighteous judgment, but judge me by righteous judgment. I come of the Father. He gave me these words to say. He's the one speaking through me. And now we take up in verse 25 in midstream of this midweek teaching that he's doing. And look at verse 25. It says, now some of them from Jerusalem said, is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? And again, they're, they're, 
they're saying, why aren't they sending someone to arrest him? How come he's not being you know, taken away? He has great boldness and he's speaking against the, the religious leaders, teaching that God is the right way, showing, you know, again, he was always at odds with the Pharisees and Sadducees. He's not afraid, he's bold. And the reason he's so bold is because this is why he had come. He had come to share the truth. He had come to die for us. And so as he's sharing, he's realizing, again, we realize he's not afraid to die. And guys, note this. This is something important for us to grasp. If you come to the place, and we all want to grow in maturity to this place, where we do not fear man, and we're not afraid to die, we are unstoppable for the kingdom of God. Jesus was unstoppable because he wasn't afraid to die. What are you going to do? Kill me? And when you kill me, I go to heaven, I live forever in glory. You see, we win no matter what the worst thing the world does to us is. And so Jesus here was, he realized that. And of course he came for the purpose of dying. But we need to understand that if if we are not afraid to die, we're unstoppable. There's nothing anyone can do to us. Jesus said this, don't fear the one that can hurt your body. Fear him who can cast your soul into hell. That's the one you should fear. And so they say, this guy doesn't fear anyone. He's bold. He's unafraid. Now look at verse 27. However, we know this man and where he's from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he's from. Now this is interesting. In that, the rabbis, at least those that were around when he was born 30-some years ago, they knew where he was from. Or at least they knew someone claiming that the Messiah was being born, was being born in Bethlehem. Because you remember when they came and they went to Herod and said, where's the Messiah going to be born? They said, in Bethlehem of Judah. Now, they probably didn't really know that Jesus was born there, but at the same time, they did recognize that that's where the Messiah would come from. And yet they're saying, well, we don't know where he's from. What, what do they mean by that? They, they knew the prophecy that said he would be born in Bethlehem and be of the line of David, but where he would live, would he live on the earth? Would he appear out of nowhere? What would happen? So they're saying, we know where he's from. He lives in Nazareth. We know his family. And they were expecting someone just to appear on the scene, like, you know, uh, just out of the blue. And yet the Lord had lived among them. And so they're acting like, well, what does this mean? We we know him. And Jesus hears them saying this. He hears the murmurs of them saying, yes, we know him. And look at verse 28. Jesus cried out as he taught in the temple and said, you both know me and you know where I'm from. I can see him just yelling that out. He hears them mumbling. He sees them talking. He knows what they're saying. Well, who is he? We know him. And who is he thinking? You know me. And you know where I'm from. That is, you know I'm from Nazareth. You know that. You understand that. He said, but I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. But I know him, for I'm from him, and he sent me. You know, the Lord was always I mean, he had to be aggravating these guys all the time, not on purpose. He wasn't doing it just to aggravate them, but get what he's doing. He's standing in the midst of the most religious group of people on the face of the earth. The Jews in all their religion, waiting on their Messiah, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And what does he say? He says, you don't know God. Wow. That's pretty bold, isn't it? And yet, how could he say that? Because he knew they were rejecting him. And anyone that rejects Jesus does not know God. That's just what the word says, bottom line. It's interesting, when I was growing up, I had a lot of guys around me and we, you know, friends and people that I knew, and, and we didn't reject Jesus openly. We didn't know we were rejecting him. But by our lives, we were rejecting him. By what we believed, we were rejecting him. And we certainly did not believe that he was the only way to heaven. We believed that all roads led to heaven, all religions lead to heaven. It doesn't have to be through Jesus. He's one way to get there. And yet suddenly, when I was born again and God opened my eyes, I realized He is the only way to heaven. There is no other way to get there except through him. And to try to go back and tell them that, you know how that comes across? Listen, you've done that. God has opened your eyes. You've gone back to your family. You've gone back to your friends. You began to share. And what do they say to you? You're so arrogant. You're so prideful. You think you have the answers. You think you know the way. It's not a matter of me thinking anything. My eyes have been opened now. I know. But how can I make you know? How can I share this with you? How can I, can, how can I help you to have your eyes open so you can see what God has shown me? And so Jesus is standing right in the middle of these religious people declaring they don't even know God. And what an insult that would be to their pride, you see. And I think the more religious someone is, the harder they are to reach for the Lord. This is one of the dangers of living in the South. And we've talked about this before. I think sometimes it's a lot easier to go somewhere where people know they don't know God rather than living in the South where everybody thinks they do. Why? And why do we think we do? Because we grew up in a Christian home, end quote. Because we, we grew up going to church, because this is the South. Now, that's not as prevalent as it used to be. 
But it used to be that everyone pretty much was going to church and everyone was at least saying they were a Christian. That's why it was such a shock to me. I was one of those everyone's growing up in church, going to church, thinking I was going to heaven, thinking I knew God and finding out very abruptly and sharply I did not know God and I was not going to heaven. That throws a wrench in your religion really fast. And so he's dealing with that right here and we deal with that in the South. I think sometimes we have to recognize that when we're talking to people is to be praying and saying, you know what, where's the fruit in your life that you know Christ? Again, not unrighteous judgment as we talked about last week, but fruit inspecting so we know how to pray and we know how to share to find out, are you really in Christ or not? And so the Lord here is crying out to them. The rabbis, they knew the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. But again, as we said, the Jewish population in general didn't know that. And, and so uh, th they think they know the Lord. They're those religious people that think they're following the Lord. He tells them, you know me. You know who I am. You know I'm from Nazareth. But here's the key thing. The problem is you don't know me spiritually is what he's saying. You know me physically, but you don't know me spiritually. See, I knew Jesus physically for years. I knew that he lived, that he died, that he went to a cross. You know, I, it's interesting. Even the phrase, when I saw the phrase Jesus saves, that didn't really affect me or help me any. Now, I'm not saying that's a bad phrase. I think that's a great phrase, and I love it. We were driving uh, back from Gatlinburg yesterday, and we're driving through Pigeon Forge. And maybe you know that place on the right, they, they have bears, they have live bears in there. And it says, Jesus saves on the front of it. You go in there, you can see the bears and give them food or whatever. And those poor bears, I mean, they've been like everybody, I think, in the nation has fed them. And, um, and they're not in the greatest health. But anyway, that's a whole other story. Um, it says, Jesus saves real big right on the outside there of the door. And I remember seeing that going, that is such a true statement. I love reading that. But it brought back to my mind this morning as I was thinking about that. When I saw that phrase before I knew the Lord, it meant nothing to me because I knew that. Yeah, Jesus saves. I didn't know really what that meant. I knew he died on a cross, but what does it mean Jesus saves? You see, I didn't know I needed to be saved. I thought I was okay. I'm going to heaven. I go to church. I'm nice sometimes. So therefore, I'm going to go to heaven. And so... It wasn't until I realized that Jesus saves only those who confess their sin, repent of their sin, and come to him. That's who Jesus saves. He died for everyone, but only those who come to him receive him. Now, I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again because some of you may not have heard it. You might say, yes, but I believe. Look at this. The demons believe that Jesus lived. The, de the demons believe that Jesus died on a cross. The demons believe that Jesus rose from the dead. The demons believe that he's the only way to the Father, and yet the demons will never enter the kingdom of God because they've been kicked out forever. What is my point? Believing all the right things doesn't get you into heaven. Here's the key word. Put it in big letters across the sanctuary. Receiving. Receiving. Got the believing part down. We need to receive him. That is, Lord, I believe it, but now I receive it. You died for me I am a sinner. I need your help. Forgive me and be my Lord. And so the problem here with this religious crowd was, is the Lord saying to them, is you know me physically, but you don't know me spiritually. And unless you come to know me spiritually, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. You don't know the one that sent me. You know me, again, in that sense, but not spiritually. You don't know God in the spiritual sense. You're lost. And notice he says in verse 30, therefore they sought to take him. That is, the crowd wanted to grab him at this point. The religious crowd was getting mad at him. This is amazing. He's surrounded by tens of thousands of people. Picture that in your mind. On the Temple Mount, tens of thousands would be up there every day during these feasts. He's surrounded by the tens of thousands. It says here they wanted to take him, but look at the rest of that sentence. But no one laid a hand on him. Here's why I have it underlined. Because his hour had not yet come. Now, that just you could read over that and go, yeah, well, it wasn't his time. Well, wait a minute. What does that mean? It means that God was giving him supernatural divine protection until it was his moment to die. The cool thing about that is the Bible says in other places he does the same thing for us. What is my point? You're not going anywhere until God says so. I'm afraid to fly. I'm afraid to fly. If I get on a plane, listen, if it's not your time, and I know, well, maybe it is. Well, listen. If you're afraid to fly and you know you're not going anywhere until God says so, you're, the plane's not going down. You're going to get there. Well, what if the plane does? What if it is my time? Look, if it's your time to go and you don't get on that plane, a big rock's going to fall on you. <laughs> I didn't want to get on the plane. I would die. I'm safe. Ah, pff, you know, now you're, you're done. 
the bottom line is when it's your time to go, you're going to go. If it's not your time to go, you can fly every plane in the world every day from now on and you're never going to crash. What about surgery? I'm afraid you want to surgery. What if I don't come out of it? Let me just say, first of all, what a great way to go into the kingdom. I'm not advocating that. I'm talking about for me. If I ever had to go, I'd much rather go in asleep and wake up in glory than to go in going, ah! If those are my two options, okay? So I'm thinking, that's not so fearful. I can handle that, right? But you go into surgery, let's say, what if I don't come out? If it is not your time to go, guess what's going to happen? You're coming out of surgery and you're going to be fine. Here's my point. It gives you rest. Believer, rest. You're not going anywhere until God says so. You're safe. You're secure. The enemy can't touch you. The world can't hurt you. Nothing's going to take you until God says so. And when God says so, he's going to do it in a gracious way. I believe he does that for every believer. He does it in a gracious way. He's going to give you the grace for whatever that time is. And he's going to usher you by his love and power into the kingdom. So we can rest and relax and trust. This is where Jesus was. It wasn't his time. No one could lay a hand on him. Tens of thousands of people could not grab him. I just think, was it angels standing there holding them back? Was it simply the power of God? I think probably just the power of God. I love it in, the, in John, we'll get to later on when the Lord's there in the garden. And he says to them, they come, they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. It was a Roman cohort. 600 to 1,000 soldiers is in a cohort, by the way. That's who came to arrest Jesus that night in the garden. 600 to 1,000, all having Roman weapons, having their shields, their swords, their torches, their authority, coming to arrest this man who dare, you know, whatever, this kind of thing. And the Bible says, the, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. It said he stood forward and said, I am. And in the original language, you lose this in the English. I wish they would write it the right way. In the original language, it says they were thrown backwards violently flat on the ground. I am. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> That's the God you serve. They didn't arrest him. He went on his own accord, and it wasn't time for him to go on his own accord, so he didn't let them arrest him. Arrest him. They were arrested by his glory. They were arrested by his power. They were arrested by who he was. This is just a powerful powerful verse and again something that should give us great rest and great comfort uh, when we think about just our how God protects us and watches over us and look what he was doing the same thing for the Lord and many of the people believed in him and they said when the Christ comes will he do more signs than these which this man has done in other words who's going to do more than this this is the Messiah I mean some of them were getting it they were like I get this he has to be the one. Now, there's going to see a whole other crowd saying, no, he's not. You know, they didn't want to believe, and their eyes were closed. The religious leaders certainly didn't want to believe. But the cool thing is, God always has a remnant, even among the Jews. And God will open the eyes of those he wants to open. You know what's really cool? I spoke with a friend of mine who lives in Israel. Um, he's a pastor. He lives over there. And he's hoping to live his whole life there. And he's, it looks like that's working out that way. But he lives in Israel. And I'm talking to him on the phone about 30, 40 minutes this week. And he said, something really cool is happening over here, Mark. I said, what is it? He said, God is moving not only among the Jewish people and getting them saved, he's moving among the rabbis. He said, he said, he said I can't verify it for sure, but I know what's happening. He said, from those in the know, connected to the synagogues, he said, there's somewhere between 80 and 100 rabbis who have now given their life to Jesus. In, in Israel. Is that awesome or what? Again, getting ready for the last days. What does the Bible say? In the last days, God will pour out his spirit on Israel and he'll reveal to them that he's their Messiah. And he said, you won't see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He said, you're going to have to acknowledge me. In other words, once you acknowledge me, I'm coming for you. The nation is going to acknowledge you. God's already moving in the heart of the rabbis. And here's the thing. They're like Nicodemus and, jo and Joseph of Arimathea. They're not revealing it yet. That ends our time at the table of God's Word for today. Pastor Mark is taking us through the book of John, the last of the four Gospels in the New Testament. This book follows Jesus through his ministry while he was here on earth, but gives you a unique perspective from one of Jesus' apostles. John paints a picture for you of the Son of God, a Savior who has all the authority and power of heaven. And we're so glad you tuned in to discover this testimony of our Lord, and we hope you'll continue to join us. Do you have a question about what you heard today? We're here to answer them. 
you can call 865-609-1385 or visit the Pastor Mark Kirk page on Facebook or visit the contact page on PastorMarkKirk.com. And if you're in the Knoxville area, we'd love to meet you. Here's Pastor Mark to tell you more. If you don't have a home church, I'd love for you to come and join us this Sunday morning at either our 930 or 1115 services. We also have a Bible study on Sunday evenings at 6, a 7 p.m. service on Wednesday, as well as activities for kids, youth, and college throughout the week. No matter what time you can come, each time we get together is a sweet time of community and learning about God. If you'd like more info about who we are and what we do, just go to PastorMarkKirk.com and click on Our Church in the menu. Thanks, Pastor Mark, and we hope you can join us next time as we continue our verse-by-verse study of John the next time we come to the table. to the table is a radio outreach ministry of Calvary Knoxville